take your Bible out and make a declaration. Say for Second Peter one twenty one says. Everybody out loud. Second Peter chapter one verse twenty one says. Holy men of old wrote. Holy men of old wrote. Okay, now the original word says under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Now, I would like to see those prophets opening their Bibles or opening their scrolls and ready to write, and here they come under the influence. Whoosh! You know, and they hoo you know, and they start writing, thus saith the Lord God. Okay, say today, dear father. Today, dear father. Would you put me under the influence <laughs> of the Holy Ghost? Of the Holy Ghost. Say, so I think I'm too sober to understand. <laughs> There's two types of drunk people. There's a drunk person that always stands and reason on the street. Why do you want to now take me home? There's the other one that says, you can take me wherever you want to take me. There's a drunk person that's always happy. That's a true drunk person. So if we can totally be under the influence of the Holy Ghost, we will just understand the word. So, dear Father, put me under the influence. Dear Father, <laughs> pass the point of reasoning to the point of believing in Jesus' name. Let's read the scripture today. Let's go to John chapter 16. Father, we thank you. Verse 16. That's good. 16, verse 16. In a little while, you will no longer see me. And again, after a short while, you will see me. Okay, just look at this. Who is talking? Jesus. Okay, who does he say, who will they not see? Him. Who does he say, who they will see? Him. So he's not referring to any other person in the Godhead but himself. A little while and you will see me no longer. And then a little while and you will see me. Okay? So some of his disciples questioned among themselves. What does he mean when he tells us, in a little while you will no longer see me. And again after a short while you will see me. And because I go to the Father. Okay? On the board. I go to the Father. And the key word he says a little while. And what does he say? You will not see me, then see me. Okay? And the key word is a little while. The second key word is because I go to the Father. A little while, you see me no more. A little while, and you see me. Huh? I know we know it, but in a while, it's going to be great. What does he mean by a little while? We do not know or understand what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Are you wondering and inquiring among yourself what I mean when I said in a little while you will no longer see me, and again after a short while you will see me? It must have been very important for Jesus to over and over say that. He already started in chapter 8. He said to the Jews, I go, and where I go you cannot follow me. Then he said in John chapter 13 to the disciples, where I go, you cannot follow me now. To the Pharisees, he said, you cannot follow me. To the disciples, he said, you cannot follow me now. And then he says, I go to my father. Because in my father's house are many dwelling places. And if I went to the father, I'll come back and take you that you can be where I am. And then he says again, a little while and you'll see me no more. A little while and you'll see me. Because I go to the Father. Then he repeats it for the fifth time. A little while and I'll go to the Father and you will not see me. In a little while you'll see me again. Because I go to the Father. Right? It's there. <laughs> I assure you most solemnly I tell you that you will weep and grieve but the world will rejoice. So these two groups. Disciples, what will they do? Grieve and weep. The world, what will they do? Rejoice and be happy. Okay? So, when did the disciples grieve? After the crucifixion of Jesus. When did the world rejoice? 
crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So it was around this because Jesus was now going to the cross. From chapter 12 right to chapter 18, Jesus is actually around the supper table. So he's telling them, this is the last time that I'll eat this bread with you. The next time we'll be in the kingdom of the Father. So as I'm breaking this bread and taking this cup, I am now going to Jerusalem to be crucified. But don't worry. When I go to be crucified, you will be grieving and the world will be rejoicing. But don't worry about that. It's only going to be a little while that I go to the Father. And after a little while, I'll be back. And when I'm back, you will... Come, come. Okay, so how long have you been waiting for Jesus to come back to rejoice? Just keep that in mind. Thank you. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that you shall weep and grieve and the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she gives birth to a child, has grief because her time has come. But when she has delivered the child she has no longer remember she no longer remembers the pain because she is so glad that a man child if anybody is excited about the maturity of the sons of god uh, and this scripture will just get you and just make some noise even if it's just mm, okay <laughs> because she is so glad that a man has been born into the world. So for the present you are also in sorrow, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one can take your joy from you. And in that hour, I assure you most solemnly, that my Father will grant you whatever you ask in my name. Up to this time you have not asked a single thing in my name, but now ask, and keep on asking and you will receive. Okay, just look this way. I think this is going to be just the greatest teaching we ever had in all our lives. Amen. So Jesus says, I go to the Father, it's going to be a little while. Then you will not see me for a little while, then just a little while. Everybody says little, 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 little. A little while. After a little while, you see me. In that little while, you will be filled with grief. But in that little while, the world will be filled with, so uh, with rejoicing. But when... You see me again. You will have rejoicing. And the rejoicing will be in this. When a woman is about to give birth, there's a lot of grief and pain. But when a man child is born. Man child is born. Okay? She will rejoice. So I say unto you, when you see me again, you will rejoice. The rejoicing is that a man child has been born. And this is the rejoicing. In that day, you can now ask what you will in my name. Now, just to ask the question, do we now have to wait for the second coming before we can ask? No. no. Do we have to go to heaven before we can ask? No. Must we now be raptured before we can ask? No, the context is I go to the Father's house. I go to my Father. I'm going to prepare a place. And then I will come back. And then you will be with me. So the context is I go to the Father. And you will be grieving because I go to the Father. But when I come back from the Father, we will be rejoicing. The rejoicing is that the man is now born. And the man being born is this. You can now ask what you will in my name and you will receive. Is that okay? Okay. Yep. Turn to Luke 24. Jesus now appeared to the people on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't know that it was him, and afterwards they said, wasn't our heart burning with us? Okay, can I throw something in? I will. Uh, remember Jesus said when he broke the bread, I will never eat of this bread again till it will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Of God. Okay? Other gospel, I will not drink of this wine again till it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What did Jesus do the night he was betrayed? He took bread, broke it, and gave thanks. Remember? Okay. So here is Jesus walking with the people on the road to Emmaus. And he was making like he was passing by. 
And they said, no, come and sleep with us for the night. So Jesus went in and the Bible says he took bread the night after or the morning after he came out of the tomb. He walked with the two people on the road to Emma's and he made like was going past the city. They invited him in and when he came in the house, he took bread and he gave thanks. And after he gave thanks, he disappeared. And their eyes were opened and they said, Were our hearts not burning in us while he was with us? What am I trying to say? Jesus is saying, The kingdom has come. I've just broken bread after the resurrection. So here I am. I said, I will not do it again before it's fulfilled in the kingdom. Here I am giving thanks. Here's the bread. Jesus disappears. They said, Wow. Kingdom has come. What did Paul preach? What does Acts 26, the last two verses says? He says, and Paul was staying in his hired house for two years and preached freely the kingdom of God. What does it say in Acts 26, 27, 28? And Paul preached and demonstrated and proclaimed and convinced the people of the kingdom. So what did Paul preach? The kingdom of God is now here. Go preach. Say the kingdom of heaven has come. And prove it with signs, wonders, and miracles. So the breaking of the bread is the kingdom has now come. Amen. Okay? That in mind. So now, the disciples, Jesus, uh, 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 Jesus came out of the tomb. The disciples were there. Mary was there, and you know, a lot of shocks happened, and you know, they ran in, found the tomb empty, you know, grave clothes lying there, angels appearing, saying he is risen, and now they're all fearing. Now they're hiding again, okay? The day of the resurrection, let's read, man, hoo-hoo. And as, verse 36, and as they thus spoke, Jesus and himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. Handle me. Touch me. For see, I, a spirit, have no flesh and bones as you have seen me have. Look at this. Jesus is now risen. He appears to the disciples and he says, Touch me. A little while and you will not see me. And a little while and you will see me. I go to the Father, but it'll be a little while and then you'll see me again. In that little while, you will be grieving and your hearts will be filled with sorrow. The world will rejoice, but in a little while you will see me. And like a woman that is in travail because a child is born, is filled with sorrow, you will be filled with sorrow. But then your grief will be turned into rejoicing because a man child has been born into the world. In that day, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that will he do. Okay, now when was the fulfillment of this awesome portion of scripture? So Jesus says, I will not drink or eat of this again till in the kingdom of the Father. So Jesus appeared unto the Emmaus people, gave thanks, broke the bread, disappeared. Kingdom come. Disciples are now hiding, filled with fear. Their hearts are broken. Jesus is gone and they've even been to the tomb and he's gone. Now they're even more sorrowful. Now they're sitting in the room, sorrowful. Here comes Jesus in the midst of them. They're shocked. He says, hey, touch me. And the Bible says, they could not speak for joy. Now we heard twice in the Bible, John chapter 16, 17, again in 1 Peter, it will be joy unspeakable. I will give you my joy so that your joy will be full. All talking about I'm going to be crucified and raised again. Okay, so Jesus says in that day your joy shall be full. Which day? When you see me again. You see, so people put that in, oh, maybe 2,000 years from now. But here comes Jesus. They've got so much joy that they can't speak it. So the only way they can do it is giggle it. So here they sit. (laughs) Joy. Okay. Unspeakable. They saw him. Okay. Okay. What did he say 40 days after that? Go, and in my name, 
Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, these signs shall follow. Go and use my name. So the scripture has been fulfilled of the little while to the Father and a little while back from the Father. So this scripture must be fulfilled that the man child has been born. Is that okay? Now we know, we know, all know the high priestly story. Uh, you do, you preachers. The high priest had to go through a cleaning ceremony before he had to go sprinkle the blood in the Holy of Holies. So after going through the whole cleansing ceremony, he had to take the blood and, you know, they go past the brazen altar, past the table of showbread, right into the Holy of Holies with his big high priestly robe with all the bells at the bottom of the rope around his feet, walking into the Holy of Holies, then sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. If God accepted the sacrifice, the sin were atoned for another year. Smoke went up into heaven. God appeared physically. Fire was burning in the Holy of Holies. And the priest came out. And then the people could touch him. And then he would sprinkle them and say, your sins have been atoned for. And then the people were blessed by the high priest. But on the way, they were not allowed to touch him because the blood was acted sacred. The blood of bulls and of goats going into the Holy of Holies. Sprinkle on the mercy seat. When he comes back, they start touching him, just trying to experience the fact that the high priestly offer and the sprinkling of the blood has been accepted for another year. So Jesus went into a more perfect, perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, but in heaven itself to appear in the presence of God, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood to bring a once and for all sacrifice so that we can once and for all be justified, be made righteous so that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. And this he did in the end of the ages to fulfill a once for all sacrifice. I go in to the heavens, into the true holy of holies, I'm going to sprinkle my blood and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you the blood has been accepted. You can now touch me. Amen. Okay, he did go into the heavens. The Bible does say with his own blood. The Bible does say he sprinkled the heavens. Okay? Are you ready? John 20. John 20. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was a Pharisee and scared of the Pharisees? And he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we perceive that you are a man sent from God. For no man can do these wonders if God is not with him. Then Jesus didn't answer his question. Jesus did it like I do it, ask my wife. <laughs> And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. I mean, he's not talking about anything about born and again. He's talking about these wonders that you do. God must be with you if you do these wonders. Jesus said, Nicodemus must be born again. Nicodemus asked him a question. Can a man be born? I just do it once more. Uh, you are preachers. <laughs> just think a little bit back you will be filled with grief your grief and sorrow will be turned into rejoicing it is like a woman when she's about to give birth she is in sorrow but when a a man child is born into the earth she rejoices so Nicodemus asks this question can a man you can check it out there in your Bible John chapter can a man be born have you got that? Yeah. Okay, so just leave it there. Can a man be born? Now, we know a man is a mature son. So we have children. Now we're back at yesterday. And then we have matured sons. Now the Bible doesn't talk about mature daughters. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. He talks about mature sons. Okay? The word son, don't think it's in gender. The word son or maturity or perfection is just to reach maturity. So when God talks about sons, he's not talking about gender. He's talking about being matured, walking and doing and talking like the Christ. Can a mature person be born? 
Can a perfected person be born? Can somebody be born perfect? Can somebody be born mature? Jesus said, when a man. So right in the beginning of creation, everything that God did, he did with the word. Ten times in the book of Genesis. Let there be light, there was light, light was good. Let there be, let there be, let there be ten times. Okay? Then God said, let us make man. Let us make man. So the Bible says, when God created them, he created them man and female. So in the making of man, it was a man it was a handmade creation. God didn't speak man into being. God made man. So the Bible says, God formed him out of the dust of the earth. My wife preached a sermon of we are little mud man. <laughs> you must actually hear that sermon. It's awesome. She said, if she was God, if that, if that, after playing with a mud cake a while and he doesn't cooperate, you know you smashed the mud cake. <laughs> But God is trying thousands of years to perfect the mud cake. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Mud Cake. And to think Paul has got the audacity to call you saints. Mud Cake Saints. Hmm? You know, we you know, God doesn't just God talks in funny and mysterious ways. You know, the other day, I, I I don't know where I came into this certain place and there was some news on the television and uh, uh, I just didn't watch because they had the Pope on there and, uh, you know, somebody just gave me a CD that the previous Pope has made somewhere when he was in his 50s or something. He made an awesome worship CD. Did you know about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a real marinating CD, man. You can sit there and just freak out. It is... <laughs> He starts off by praying in, 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 in Portuguese and then in Italian, praying the most awesome prayers. And they've got the most beautiful music there, man. <laughs> and then he prays and prophesies. So, oh my goodness, you know. And then he speaks in tongues and talks about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Pope. But, you know, he was on the news and, uh, and, 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 and they were telling and asking the people in the Vatican now what is happened now since and they took their way they've got the statue and said uh, now the Pope is now a saint so do you now pray yeah he's now a saint to pray, pray to him and then I realized my goodness I'm not going to die and become a saint I am a saint I, <laughs> I want to be saint quibbers now <laughs> and then it, is a, it was a shock. I stood up in our church. It was about two months ago. I stood up in our church and I started addressing the people. I said, oh, good morning, saints. And I realized in the 40 revival, that was very famous, especially in the church of God, where the brother comes from, they used to address the church as saints in the morning. They used to stand up and say, well, we greet all the saints in the name of the Lord Jesus. All you set apart ones, all you partakers of the heavenly calling, be blessed in Jesus' name. Let's open our Bibles. And they didn't have the problem that some churches have today because the people were addressed as who they were in Christ, not as the beggars and sinners and paupers. We try to make them sometimes. So I thought, maybe we should try addressing people. Well, we greet all the holy saints, set apart ones, partakers of the heavenly calling, partakers of the high calling. Hey, you super jibu, jibi jibi. <laughs> So, so, God made man, formed him out of the dust, after his, in his own image and after his own likeness. So there it is where we were yesterday. So man, God stood back and says, looks just like me. In my image. <laughs> after my own likeness. Wow. So God breathed on him. The breath of life. Breath of life. And man stood up 
a living soul. Wow! And God says to him, have dominion. Subdue creation. I have given you all power and all authority over all power of the enemy. How could he, how could he subdue if there was no enemy? That word subdue is go and put under control. So God took him from where he made him and took him to garden. God planted a garden in Eden. God took man and put him in the garden. And God said to him, now you've got to better use your authority because there's somebody coming. So here comes Mr. Devil. In the beginning he was a liar. Last night's sermon. And he said, is it true? So he's lying. <laughs> Come on, I'm trying to help those that were there last night that struggled with Satan and Jesus. You know, I said last night, Satan was a created being, not a fallen angel. And he was in the garden before there was a man. So when man was in the garden, who faced him? Satan. And what did he say? Is it true? So he was there before man was there. And Jesus said in John 8, he was a liar right there in the beginning. It's in your Bible. You don't have to try and think it out. It's just there. So in the beginning, he was a liar. So he came and said, is it true that God said? So he's lying. Okay, so in Genesis 6, God says, My spirit shall not forever now abide with man, because he is now also flesh. Mm 